near 70. Your life, your music, we're KLEK 1 to 2.5 FM. From Feature Story News in London, I'm Oli Barrett. Several European countries have recognized Venezuela's opposition leader Juan Guaido as the interim president. The Air Accident Investigation Branch says a body can be seen in the wreckage of a crashed plane that was carrying a Premier League footballer. UK MPs are starting three days of Brexit meetings to seek an alternative to the Irish border backstop solution. And tens of millions of pilgrims have gathered in northern India for the main bathing day of India's Kumbh Mela. It's 9.01. KLEK LP Jonesboro, the voice of Arkansas Minority Advocacy Council. It's now time for Community Conversations, a program focusing on the people working to make the Jonesboro community a better place while offering viewpoints from all sides of the issues. The views expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of KLEK 102.5 FM, the voice of Arkansas Minority Advocacy Council, or our underwriters or sponsors. Good morning, everyone, and happy Monday to you. I hope that you're having a great start to your day. You're tuned in to Community Conversations on KLEK 102.5 FM. And my special guests, which are on the phone with me today, are from the Arkansas Department of Health out of Little Rock, Arkansas. So I have with me on the phone Mr. Grant Stewart and Mr. John Allen, and then we'll have someone else joining us a little bit later on. Good morning, gentlemen. Hi, we've actually had our third person join us this morning. Uh, all right, good so good morning. So the third person, and I'm going to try to say this slow so I do not slaughter her name, um, Zawakana. Yes, that's perfect. Okay, Zawakana Bello. 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 Okay. <laughs> I apologize. It's okay. Thank you all so much for joining us today. And we're going to be discussing um, AIDS awareness. And even though the you know National Awareness Day has passed, we can never talk enough about this topic because there are so many individuals that are contracting the HIV virus which eventually turns into AIDS. Um, we just want to raise awareness so that everyone can start taking the steps needed to hopefully prevent you know themselves from contracting this disease. So uh, first of all we'd like for you all to please uh, take turns and introduce yourself briefly and tell us what role you play with the Arkansas Department of Health. My name is John Allen. I'm a physician assistant HIV specialist at the Department of Health. I also see patients at UAMS in, in their Ryan White Clinic. And then I have two uh, telemedicine clinics that I do with uh, Magnolia, Arkansas and Fort Smith, Arkansas through the UAMS uh, Center for Distance Health. Okay. I've um, been seeing HIV patients for um, 30 years. The first seven years were in uh, Los Angeles and then I've uh, been in Arkansas since 1996. Okay, wow. So I want to thank you for your service and thank you for what you do to try to educate the community and individuals you serve and try to hopefully keep them healthy. All right. And who's the next, uh, Mr. Grant? Hi, I'm, I'm Grant Stewart. I am in the health communications department over here at the Department of Health and I, I mostly just handle communications here for the department. So. All right. And then Mrs. Bilo, or Miss, yes. I'm sorry. No, you're fine, Ms. Gilo. Um, yes, yeah, so I am actually the STD Prevention Field Operations Manager for the um, agency. And I supervise our disease intervention specialists. And our disease intervention specialists are what we like to call our boots on the ground. They're actually the ones who, anyone who is uh, diagnosed, whether it was HIV, syphilis, or any of the other STDs that we track, they ensure that these clients are getting into care, getting the services and the medication that they need contacting their partners, ensuring that they get tested and get services as well. Um, in terms of our HIV um, clients, we also ensure that they're linked to care. Um, we connect them with our Ryan White program, and they provide a lot of services for our HIV clients as well. I've been working in um, STD prevention for about three years now. I'm actually a Georgia native. I've been here in Arkansas going on nine years, but I love, love, love what it is that we do. So. All right. But thank you all so very much for that. Now let's get right into our questions. And I sent another lady the questions, so I hope that she shared them with you all. Um, but there are basic things that you all discuss, I'm sure, on a regular basis with the individuals that you uh, serve. So we want to. I want the first question though. 
is what is AIDS and how is it different from HIV? I know that seems a little redundant for some, but there may be some people who may not really know the difference. So AIDS was defined uh, as a case definition in 1993. And when people have HIV for a number of years and their immune system gets weak, uh, they can be um, vulnerable to a number of infections and there are several infections that are listed that people normally don't get if they have a healthy immune system um, and the presence of one of those infections can define a person as having AIDS rather than HIV. In addition to that, there's some cancers like Kaposi sarcoma, cervical cancer in women um, and, and also the presence of a lower number when we measure how well the immune system works. So. Um, that, that number is less than 200 and may make a person more vulnerable to getting one of those infections. Oh, wow. So that, that definition uh, was, was defined in, in the early 90s before we had effective HIV medication. What's different now, um, since about 96 or 97, is when people are on effective HIV, a combination of effective HIV medications, that low number um, that defines a person as getting AIDS can go back up in the normal range. Their risk of those infections uh, can go down to zero and mm. they can return to work. So as somebody that's been doing this for a long, long time, you know, the AIDS is kind of like figured out on the blackboard to me because the message that I try to convey to my patients is if you take these medications every day, you'll live a normal lifespan. Um, but the AIDS case definition is, is kind of what the CDC uses uh, for their funding as well. And if we have a lot of cases of people with AIDS, that, that the state would get more funding, especially in an, ur- in an urban area. All right. You, and I'm going to ask that question a little later concerning statistics and reporting. But I want to go to this question. Even I know that you use the terminology infection. There are some people who still, and again, I'm not trying to make anyone out there feel dumb or ignorant or unintelligent as if you don't know there are there are some people though that are still unclear on a lot of the definitions and terminology surrounding this disease so i just want to make sure that we're covering all the bases so if anyone has any questions or any doubts you know they are fully informed after they listen to this interview um so can you give us a breakdown on the difference between a virus and an infection so the, the HIV virus is, is the viral particle that can actually um, lead to infection. For everyone who's infected, that virus remains as a chronic disease. It can't be cleared. You know, like we can clear and, and cure hepatitis C now. Okay. Uh, today, we, we don't have a cure for HIV. So even people that are on effective medication, if we measure their viral load, it can be undetectable. That doesn't mean they're cured. It means that medicines do a great job of putting down the virus. Okay. In, in addition to the virus um, being in the body as a, as, a, as a viral particle, also the instructions for making more virus, the, the RNA, DNA of the virus can be hidden inside cells throughout the body. And those can emerge at any time. If somebody gets an infection, the virus can get expressed out of those cells. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, that's one of the reasons that we can't cure HIV, even if we can press it all the way down to undetectable, we can never get rid of that, that genetic information hidden in those cells that will that'll emerge again if we stop the medication. Okay, well, thank you. All right, so, and then let's talk about how it's contracted um, or trans- and transmitted. Um, again, you know, you mentioned how there was a lot of misconception, a lot of misinformation when this... Um, when AIDS, HIV first hit the scene, you know, back in the early 90s. And people thought, you know, if I just touch someone, I could catch it. If I drink behind them, there were so many myths out there. And with the increased uh, advancement in technology, medical uh, and in the medical community, um, there's a lot more information that's available, a lot more correct information I should say that's available so can you please talk about the myths and the facts concerning contracting and transmitting so HIV is um, 
transmitted sexually um, by blood transfusion, rarely by needle stick. Sometimes it, it could be transmitted through um, contaminated tattoo equipment. For but for the most part, it's going to be either transmitted sexually or sharing needles via uh, injection drug use. Okay. Uh, the the uh, the way that it's not transmitted is that if people get tested and they know their status and they get on medication and they have an undetectable viral load, they take their medication every day, um, they will not transmit HIV to other people. Okay. Um, so so our push, and I'm, I'm going to let Swakana talk about this because what she does is incredibly important, um, people knowing their status and getting on medication is a way that we can end the HIV epidemic. And in Arkansas, you know, there's 6,000 6, people that are living with HIV. If we had everybody on effective medication, we wouldn't have any new cases. Um, in, in addition, um, Arkansas, like other states, have, have what are called late testers. And those are folks that um, don't know their HIV status, get tested after they've had, the, had HIV for several years, and, and at the time of their diagnosis, they have a, either an opportunistic infection or a low immune uh, system count. So it's very, very important for people to get tested, know their status, and um, get on medication so the virus is not transmitted. Okay. And then along with that, um, if you know, if you feel you are at risk, uh, start practicing safe measures <laughs> so that you protect others around you or your partner, whoever you're with. Um, and that's, we'll get more into that as well. Um, let's talk about, you know, once someone, first of all, how are, how is someone diagnosed? What is the initial screening, um, or testing like? Well, a person might get tested, uh, hopefully will get tested in their primary care physician's office. Um, okay. There's been a re recommendation, um, to test everybody not just folks that are at risk or higher risk for getting HIV, okay. but everybody uh, should get an HIV test at least once if they're between the ages of 15 and, and uh, 70. Okay. People are also tested at blood banks and plasma donation centers. Uh, they're tested for um, insurance company applications. Um, some are tested when they're actually sick. And again, we don't want that. We want people to get tested routinely so that we pick up the infection early. Anyone who, and if I may add to anyone who is interested in becoming te getting tested, say for instance they think they may have been exposed to HIV and they would like to get tested, the health department also provides as HIV and STD testing as well. So individuals can come visit their local health unit. We have one in every county throughout the state. They can come and be tested as well. And that's even if they do or don't have insurance, they are more than welcome to come and get tested. Um, we also host a variety of testing events as well. So they can also um, be on the lookout for those as well if they would like to come and get tested. Okay. Thank you so much for that. And so that's incredible work that our prevention staff does and going out in the field, going to colleges, um, e even in bars, um, everywhere that people are that haven't been tested, they go out and um, test people and if they're positive, get them into care right away. All right. Um, and I'm going to ask you about some statistics in a moment. I just want to get through some of the basic, you know, questions, things that people may feel like they already know, but it's never, we can never again talk about this information enough. Uh, we want to make sure everyone is equipped with the knowledge um, that they need to um, take care of themselves and to advocate for others around them. So once someone has been diagnosed, let's talk about treatment options you mentioned medications early on and i know that every case is different so can you break that down for us as well um for those that think well i have it or someone else has it, we can take the same medication we can do the same things that doesn't always work for everyone so can you please elaborate on that so the older medications that we had had a lot more side effects and in general um the effectiveness of those medications that, you know, they, they didn't always last as long as we wanted them to. But once we started combining three drugs together, um, many people could remain on the same medication for 10 years. And the trend for the medications that have been developed are, are what are called single tablet regimens. So meaning that those three or four 
medications are combined into one tablet, and the patient just takes one tablet once a day. Oh. Uh, as I mentioned, um, many of those newer medications are, are medications that patients can take without any side effects at all. And for most that start them out, it, it can be something that can cause a little bit of nausea or a little headache for the first couple of weeks. And for almost everyone that goes away, there are exceptions to that, but most patients can take medications uh, without a lot of side effects. Okay. The, the other thing is, is access to care. So we do have people in Arkansas that don't have insurance. Um, for them, there's the, the Ryan White program, and we have um, about 2,000 people that get some assistance from the Ryan White program, whether they our program pays their um, their co-pays for their medication uh, or may, might pay their health insurance premium. And then we have about 1,600 people who have no insurance whatsoever who have the entire cost of all their HIV medications and all the labs and, and the uh, clinic visits related to their HIV that are paid for 100% of, through that federal program, the Ryan White program. The Ryan White program, okay. I'm going to make a note of that and look that up and share the link on our social media pages so that people can be aware of uh, the resources that are available to them. Another thing, too, that I wanted to mention, Q, and uh, just wanted to emphasize one of the things that John mentioned about the medications. The medications that um, clients have access to are highly effective. Okay. So he dropped the term about being undetectable or virally suppressed. Okay. And so anyone who is HIV positive and taking medication as prescribed, the likelihood of them transmitting the virus to a person who is HIV negative is slim to none. So them transmitting it to someone is unlikely to happen. And so the medications are very effective to where um, the, someone who is positive can live a healthy, long, uh, quality lifestyle as anyone who is HIV negative. So I just wanted to emphasize um, just how valuable and effective being on an HIV care regimen is. Well, okay, since you mentioned that, um, if the person that is infected affected infected um and they are on their um regimen they're doing everything they're supposed to do and would you still though advise them to practice safe sex just because well absolutely we practice we so we advise anyone to practice safe sex whether you're hiv positive or you're not hiv positive um much 
cancer rate has, has um, been there since the start of the illness. Yes. We, we all harbor tens of thousands of different organisms in our body. Some are harmful, some are not. And there's just billions and billions of, of organisms in our body at all times. Why we single out this one virus and, and you know, marginalize people who have it, that, that, is, that in and of itself is responsible for uh, a, a lot of the difficulties that people have living with HIV. Um, I recall a lot of my patients that they have to hide their medications from their family. Obviously, that's not good for wow. the prospect of taking them every day. They, they don't disclose their, their infection to loved ones, and that, that makes it more difficult um, for them to, to, uh, to live with the illness. And, and, and then, again, the whole stigma of the people that have HIV, there's something wrong with them, they did something wrong, it's their fault that they got it, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's something that uh, um, you know, make, can make depression worse, and, and that's, that's not what we should be doing. Okay. We're going to have to put a pin right here. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll pick up our discussion. And then we will talk about some of those social and emotional effects on individuals that have been diagnosed. We'll be right back after these announcements. You're listening to Community Conversations on KLEK 102.5 FM. We'll be right back. Is your teen preparing to leave home? I'm Mark Merrill with today's Family Minute. Over the past few years, I've watched all five of my kids grow up and head out into the world. While I can't be with them as they journey into life after high school, I worked hard to prepare them. So if your teen is about to leave the nest, be sure to share these 10 life skills with them. First, make sure they know some basic cooking skills. They'll be much better off knowing how to prepare a few simple, healthy dishes rather than eating out for every meal. Second, it's important for your child to know how to keep a budget and manage their money. Remember, your family first. Want to connect with Mark on Twitter? Follow him at twitter.com slash Mark Merrill. The Family Minute with Mark Merrill. Helping families love well. Family Minute is made possible by the Kappa Nu Omega chapter of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, a nonprofit organization committed to service to all mankind. Kappa Nu Omega Alpha Kappa Alpha on Facebook and K N O M E G A 1908.com. Family Minute is brought to you by the Gears Foundation, a nonprofit organization providing students with assistance in their academic and career pursuits. Gears Foundation on Facebook gears underscore inc on instagram and the gears foundation at gmail.com this portion of klek programming can be made possible by your business your support will help in educating entertaining and empowering the community by supporting local talent serving the community you love and providing information on issues you care about from a different perspective call 870-203-9951 or visit klekfm.org to learn how we can help connect you more with the community or visit us at 1411 Franklin Street, KLEK 102.5 Jonesboro, educating, entertaining, and empowering the community. Experience the joy with Bishop Adrian R. Rogers, pastor of Fullness of Joy Church, 2120 Thorn Street, Jonesboro, Arkansas, 72401. Wednesday night, Word and Worship, 7 p.m. Prayer, Thursday night at 7 p.m. Sunday School, 9.30 a.m. Sunday Morning Worship, 11 o'clock a.m. And our Sunday Night Live Service at 7 p.m. And now, back to Community Conversations on KLEK 102.5 FM. All right, welcome back to Community Conversations on KLEK 102.5 FM. As stated earlier in the first part, I'm on the phone with Mr. John Allen, who is a physician assistant with Arkansas Department of Health. Ms. Zawa, okay, <laughs> sorry, Zawakani, Zawakana Bilo, and uh, Mr. Grant Stewart. They're all from the Arkansas Department of Health. And we'll be discussing um, HIV and AIDS awareness. This is one topic that we can never talk about enough because there have been so many advancements in, tech, in the medical 
technology and medications and things that are available to the general public, um, we just want to make sure everyone is informed. And so they know what they're up against and they know what testing is available, what medications, what treatments are available. Um, so I hope that everyone is out there taking notes and paying attention and you are learning some facts versus, you know, running with the myths uh, that you've heard since the beginning of, um, since HIV and AIDS first basically hit mainstream. All right, so we're going to move on to talking about some statistics and breaking down the numbers across the board, age, gender, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. Um, so let's get into, and more specifically, as it relates to Arkansas, since we all live in Arkansas right now. So where would you all like to start? Um, well, I'm going to go ahead and just talk about our 2017 um, surveillance report and uh, just kind of give you guys a general overview in terms of the information that we collect and the information that is provided in terms of HIV in Arkansas. And I would like to add that anyone who is interested can actually visit our website, and that's healthy.arkansas.gov, and they too can have access to this um, report if they were interested in seeing um, kind of what HIV looks like in their specific area and county. So it is available to any and everyone. Um, but according to our 2017 surveillance report, um, the number of new HIV cases that we had for 2017 was 406, and that's throughout the state of Arkansas total. Um, so that means uh, currently we have um, 11,405 Arkansans um, who are HIV infected or living with HIV. Um, in terms of uh, race and age, um, the, the majority of individuals are African American, followed by a white non Hispanic. And, and in terms of age, um, those persons who were newly diagnosed in 17 range from 15 to 34, so it's fairly young. Um, also, in terms of counties, Keep in mind, these are just individuals who have gotten tested. Okay. So these are individuals who may be living with HIV, don't know that they're living with HIV because they haven't gone and gotten tested for HIV. Okay. So these are just individuals who we know um, that we've tested or that have been tested throughout the state for this particular year. So in terms of areas, of course, those areas where there is... Um, uh, have a higher number in terms of population tend to have a higher number of those who are living with HIV. So Pulaski County being number one, um, Washington County, Jefferson County, those are just some areas that tend to have a higher number. Does that mean that a smaller area does not have anyone living with HIV? No, but that um, they just don't have a higher case because the population is also smaller. Let me ask you and this. We actually, oh. yes. No, go ahead. No, I was just going to say that we do not collect information on socioeconomic status. Okay. It's primarily age, race, gender. Okay. And I didn't touch on gender. In terms of gender, um, men are mostly affected in here in Arkansas. Oh, wow. I, don't, I would have... I don't know. I guess I haven't put much thought into it. Our case has been three quarters. Our case has been three quarters men, one quarter women. Yes. And half of our new infections are, are with among men who have sex with men. Okay, so overall, forty-four percent of our cases are, are among African Americans. Okay, and this is, and I'm gonna make this statement. This is in no way judging anyone. So please, no one come from my head. But we have seen in our society that there are many people living double life lifestyles and um, are not taking, are not, not being safe with their practices as they should be. And the person that they're with may either, like you said, may not have been tested and know they're living with this infection. And so they are passing it on unknowingly. Um, so there, are, but there are a lot of other factors and I'm not trying to, put anyone down or judge their lifestyle I'm just making a statement that 
from personal observation, um, there has been a rise in different people because of people's lifestyles. There has been a rise in some of the numbers. Is that something that you may have seen with your research and um, discussions with the patients that you all serve? So that kind of speaks to what would be a contributing factor in terms of the transmission of HIV, you know, being on the rise. And there's a number of reasons. Um, someone's lifestyle could potentially be one, but the overall arching personally would be stigma that John mentioned okay. uh, before. People not wanting to either know because of the lifestyle that they may be living. You also have to keep in mind with Arkansas being in the South, being a Bible Belt um, state, some individuals who um, men who have sex with men, for example, may not be comfortable with um, disclosing the type of lifestyle that they live due to how they may be treated by others in society. If someone is not educated about, hey, you cannot get HIV by, you know, touching or holding hands or, sh- you know, sharing X, Y, and Z, um, they, may, they may not want to disclose their um, lifestyle because of how they may be treated, um, depending on religious beliefs, um, they may be shunned because of the lifestyle that they live. So there's a number of factors, um, stigma being one of them, um, lack of education being another um, that can contribute to um, the, the rise okay. or the spread. And absolutely, and also can keep people from getting tested. Absolutely. So, you know, contrast what uh, Sawakana said about our numbers in Arkansas to um, national numbers and, and also um, globally. Uh, there's 1.2 million people living with HIV in the U.S. and about 40,000 new cases annually. But in Africa, um, most of the cases there are, are heterosexual transmission and not from men who have sex with men. Two-thirds of all the cases Globally, of those 40, 40 million cases are in sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, you know, we, we in this country we can be kind of quick to say, you know, that that's because you have sex with men or because you use IV drugs that you have HIV. Okay. But but again, um, HIV is sexually transmitted. We're all human. We all take risks. You know, one of the the huge problems in Arkansas is the obesity epidemic. And, Okay. And, uh, and and a lot of people overeat and overdrink, and um, the, you know people <laughs> are not are, are not quick to point that out and say you should stop doing this, and then you, you know you wouldn't have these health problems. But but you know and yet we do that with people with HIV infection. Okay. One thing too, Q, um, that I also would like to add is that um, even though men who have sex with men um, tend to have the highest rates of HIV infections, that's not to say that a woman cannot become HIV infected as well, and she shouldn't go and get tested for HIV, or to add, like what John said, heterosexual couples shouldn't go and get tested for HIV as well. Sexual contact is a way that HIV is transmitted, but it's not the only way that HIV is transmitted as well. Sharing needles, as he mentioned, is also another way that HIV is transmitted. Um, It's rare, but it's also possible for a mother to transmit it to her her child through breast milk as well. So there's a number of ways. Children are also born with HIV. Um, So like he said, just to further emphasize, you don't want to just categorize or classify one group of people saying, oh, well, they're the ones who have or are doing or are spreading it when that's not necessarily the case. So it's now rare for a woman to transmit HIV to her her baby uh, now that we have effective medication. So if in nationally and also in Arkansas, and Arkansas was one of the first states to implement HIV testing in prenatal care. So if every woman in Arkansas that becomes pregnant is offered an HIV test at their first prenatal visit. 
and if um, and if they're positive, we immediately put them on medication, and the chances of them transmitting HIV to their baby it, it you know approaches um, less than one percent. So again, very very rare now for HIV to be transmitted. Most of the times that might, that might occur is if a woman doesn't get prenatal care and doesn't get tested, um, and then uh, um, transmission normally happens in, in labor and delivery. Okay. I want to ask this question, and I don't know if you have the research on it. Um, I have uh, regular conversations with social workers here um, from the college, and we talk about um, health disparities, and more particular in the Delta area and other areas where um, they're more rural, rural, or they are there are more people with living in a lower social economic status. Do you? Based on your research, um, have you seen maybe a rise or higher numbers in areas where there is less access to either quality medical care or medical care at all? Um, where just I'm trying to access in a polite way. <laughs> um, based on your numbers, have you seen? I hope I, you understand where I'm coming from. I'm trying to be polite about this and not make anyone feel like I am putting them down because of where they live or who they are. (laughs) So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we don't collect information on social economic status, but um, in terms of access and availability to care and resources in some of the more rural areas, it is limited. Um, That doesn't mean that they don't have access or aren't welcome to come to neighboring um, counties or area where there is um, care and services available. But yes, in more rural areas, in terms of access, it is limited. Okay. And And, and that that can be um, that can be linked to the number of new infections in that county because if there aren't um, if people aren't in care, they're not on medications, they're going to be more likely to transmit the virus. And also, if they're not in care, they're not going to know their their status, and, and they're, they're not going to uh, more like they're more likely to uh, transmit the virus. So in Arkansas, um, a lot of the people who provide HIV care, a lot of the specialists are in Central Arkansas or in Northwest Arkansas. But there's many, many great providers several years have, have been um, you know, providing care in West Memphis and, and in, in Texarkana, Fort Smith, and they're, they're dedicated. And, and also, the, the, just as importantly, the, the RN case managers with the Ryan White program who work very hard to, to keep people in care and, and, and uh, help them with all the support that they need to get the medication. Um, but for the most part, part HIV specialists are are in the larger cities in Arkansas, so we're, we're really needing to develop new providers. And there's many um, physicians and APNs and PAs in those rural areas that are that are um, working to get the expertise to be able to treat HIV infection, um, and, and uh, so that their patients don't have to travel several hours, especially if they don't uh, have a vehicle or, or don't have the money to pay for gas. I was going to ask you about what can um, counties do, individuals, organizations do to help raise awareness and help the individuals get the get access to the care that they need. Um, I'm an advocate for a particular condition that I have, and I've been talking with medical professionals about at least starting with Northeast Arkansas, since that's where I live, um, starting with those counties and those health departments and medical professionals and if we start, we got to start somewhere trying to raise awareness and spreading education. Um, so I was going to ask, what, with the advancement of technology and information, what are you all now doing, just say from 2019 going forward? What are your goals? What are some of your plans on helping to increase education, awareness, and care in those areas that are lacking? So one of the things that our program um, has done and is doing it is to provide further education and information to not only community members but providers as well. Um, so we're definitely trying to increase 
um, awareness of the advancements that are available and that are that can be offered to clients um, should a provider be willing and is available to give them those things. We're 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 able to provide them that information and that education. Um, I know our team has. Um, attempted to do that. John has also been very successful and helpful in um, further spreading the information to providers as well. So if anyone who is um, willing to, would like to not only get the information, but also provide care or services to clients who need HIV care services, they can contact the health department and we'll be more than willing to meet them where they're at and provide them with the information and the tools that they need. Okay. And do you host um, regularly scheduled maybe community events um, or do you partner with other organizations and set up a table or information booth to also pass out information or talk with individuals one-on-one to encourage them to get their screenings and initial testings and follow-up testings? Absolutely, we do that on a regular basis. We have some partnerships that we have ongoing annually. Um, We also have some that we do every three months. We may provide um, the testing kits for them to do the testing themselves. Um, Our HIV prevention team also has grantees who are um, community persons who are uh, regularly out in the community spreading the information, providing testing for those who um, would like to get tested. Um, And also anyone who is interested in hosting a testing event or would like us to come and provide information, if we're invited, we'll come. Okay. Now for those that may have, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Up, up in Northeast Arkansas, um, and, you know, we're talking about the things that the health department does, but but there's a lot of champions all throughout the state. And Absolutely. Then, like in, in your neck of the woods, uh, the our care the medical organization that mm-hmm. that does a lot of uh, uh, primary care also does a great deal of the HIV care. And Dr. Dan Moore up there uh, has has done that probably for 15 or 20 years, and and also educates a lot of family practice residents and providers up there. There's lots of um, case managers, both with the RIY program and community people who volunteer to get people into testing and care. Um, there, are, there are people like Danny Harris that, that, that do uh, support groups um, that, to support people with HIV, living with HIV so that they stay in care and get what they need, um, you know, men- mentally and, and spiritually as well. Okay. You know, and there's a, a lady that I came across. She's from St. Francis County, and her name is Miss Connie Roebuck. I don't know if you all are familiar with her. Um, Absolutely. You uh, work with Connie all the time. I was actually going to mention her, too. (laughs) (laughs) I actually did an interview with her, and I love how open and candid she was about her story. And she is now a big advocate. You know, she talks to any and everybody. She's like, I am not ashamed. I pass out condoms. I do whatever it takes to get people to become more aware and take care of themselves. <laughs> Absolutely. Connie's awesome. All right, so... Like uh, John said, she's a, a champion out in the community. Yes. And we're going to get ready for another quick break. And for those that may have missed um, the information before, can you please give us a website um, where people can go to make initial contact with their local providers to get the ball rolling for either testing or information? Absolutely. So the website to visit is healthy.arkansas.gov, and they'll just click on the HIV STD page. And all of the information as well as contact information is provided on that page. Okay. All right, so we're going to take a quick break. Um, Mr. John or Mr. Grant, do you have anything in the next 30 seconds you would like to share before we go to break? Um, You know, Zawak and I was talking about champions, and and, uh, the the other thing that I wanted to add is because it's so important for people to be in care and be on medication, stay on medication, is that... There's a national trend that those people who have been specialists in HIV care, a lot of them are nearing retirement. So there has to be a new pool of uh, APNs and PAs and physicians and RNs who who want to do HIV care, not necessarily as a specialist, but but also as as part of their practice if they're doing primary care to be able to take care of all the folks we have living with HIV. 
You're listening okay. to Community Conversations on KLEK 102.5 FM. We'll be right back. We're back with Money Matters. I'm Alfred Edmund Jr. So here's today's lesson. You cannot improve your finances without living on a budget. People who manage money well know three things at all times. First, they know their expenses for the year, for each month, and often by the day. They have a plan for their spending, so they know their household costs and obligations like the back of their hand. Two, they know exactly where their money goes. They never look up at the end of the month surprised that they're broke and wondering where all their money went. They understand to the penny how their money is spent and what they spent it on. And finally, they know where they want their money to go. They have goals for every area code. So here's the reality. If you're not serious about budgeting, you're not serious about building wealth. And whatever wealth you have, you likely won't have for long. I'm Alfred Edmund Jr. for Money Matters at AURN.com. Money Matters is made possible by the Jonesboro Alumni Chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, a nonprofit organization focused on joy in our sisterhood, power in our voice, and service in our hearts. www.jonesboroalumni.dst.org. Money Matters is brought to you by the Gears Foundation, a nonprofit organization providing students with assistance in their academic and career pursuits. Gears Foundation on Facebook, Gears underscore Inc. on Instagram, and the Gears foundation at gmail.com calling all women and minority business owners as well as the general public klek 102.5 fm presents the 2019 women and minority business showcase saturday february 16th from noon until 6 at centennial hall in the arkansas state university student union live broadcast on klek and on facebook this is your opportunity to show what your business church or organization has to offer to the unique diverse audience of klek listeners supporters and the jonesboro community as a whole or to just check out all the vendors in attendance. Vendor registration is $25, $50 if you sell items on site, and you can register at klekfm.org, but you must register by February 4th. Free admission to attend. The KLEK Women and Minority Business Showcase is sponsored by the Arkansas State University Office of Diversity and Community Engagement, Full Sun Gifts, and Bancorp South. This event is a KLEK fundraiser. Edgy Studios, 209 Union Street in Jonesboro, offers photography for portraits, weddings, and engagements, senior portraits, family, and maternity shoots, and all occasions. Edgy Studios focuses on photography that is unique and outside of the norm. Owner Andrew Daly is available at 870-243-0308 or www.ejjistudios.com. House of Details, located at 3915 East Highland in Jonesboro, is a proud supporter of KLEK, offering detailing on any type of vehicle, basic wash, hand wash, shampoo, interior cleaning, waxing, buffering, headlight restoration, pickup, delivery, and more, with the motto of, anything mean, we can clean. Details at 870-273-5187, House of Details on Facebook, and at klekfm.org. The Mu Omicron Lambda Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated was established on January 1st, 1977. Originally serving Blytheville, Arkansas, and now serving Jonesboro, Blytheville, Osceola, Marion, and West Memphis, Arkansas. Today, the chapter continues to make an impact by focusing on Alpha's national community outreach initiatives, such as My Brother's Keeper, A Voteless People is a Hopeless People, Go to High School, Go to College, Project Alpha, Boy Scouts, and the March of Dimes. The Mu Omicron Lambda Chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated is committed to Alpha mission of developing leaders, promoting brotherhood and academic excellence, while providing service and advocacy to the community. More information about the Mu Omicron Lambda chapter of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated is available at MOL Alphas on Facebook or via email at molalphas at gmail.com. 
KLEK is starting a new fundraiser which will allow listeners to donate to KLEK while buying groceries. KLEK is a part of the Kroger Community Rewards fundraising program. When shoppers visit a participating Kroger and scan his or her Kroger Plus Shoppers card, a portion of the savings goes back to KLEK to help keep it on the air. Details on how to sign up for the program are available at KrogerCommunityRewards.com and at KLEKFM.org. This is a KLEK fundraiser. And now back to Community Conversations on KLEK 102.5 FM. All right, welcome back to the last segment of Community Conversations on KLEK 102.5 FM. Again, I have on the phone with me Mr. John Allen, Ms. Zawa. Zawakania, Zawakana, I'm sorry, Zawakana Bilo and Grant Stewart from the Arkansas Department of Health. Even though they're outside of Little Rock, Arkansas, they work uh, on over Arkansas in connection with other um, Arkansas Department of Health agencies. So again, thank you all so much for joining me on the phone today and giving us your time and sharing this valuable information. So in this last segment, I want to give you all the opportunity to follow up on things that we've stated, we talked about early on for those who may have missed it, and just wrap up anything that we did not discuss that you want to make sure the community is aware of. So whoever wants to go first. Um. So one of the things that we talked about um, was just modes of transmission and just wanted to emphasize that, um, like John mentioned, sexual contact is one, um, needle sharing is also another. Um, and in terms of modes of transmission, too, with sexual contact, I also thought, think it's important to mention the type of bodily fluid okay. that HIV is present in that further transmits the, the virus, if you will. So when we're talking about uh, bodily fluids, it's of course there's blood, there's semen, um, vaginal fluids, pre-seminal fluids, and then of course, even though it's rare, breast milk is still considered a bodily fluid in terms of transmission. So it doesn't matter what type of sex you're engaging in or who you're engaging it with, if any of these bodily fluids are transmitted where the person who does have or is living with HIV transmitted to a person who doesn't have it, then it is possible to become infected with the HIV um, virus. Okay. And then I also wanted to emphasize, too, when we were talking about AIDS, that there's no such thing as going and getting an AIDS test. We hear that all the time, oh, I'm going to go and get tested for AIDS. You cannot or will not have AIDS unless you first have HIV. Okay. And HIV is human immunodeficiency virus. So no, you're not getting it from insects or mosquitoes. It is a human-to-human virus that's transmitted, and then it can progress to AIDS, which is a syndrome or a diagnosis that a physician or physician assistant has to make. So just wanted to to emphasize um, that because we hear a lot of miscommunication or misinformation when it comes to um, HIV and AIDS. Okay. Thank you so much for clarifying that. Um, just, I hope everyone again is taking notes and hopefully becoming more aware of the information and um, access to treatment that's available. Um, there are a lot of resources. Again, can you give us the website again where people can visit to find more information? Absolutely. It's healthy.arkansas.gov. And they'll just click on the HIV STD page, and it'll take them to all of the information and contact information that they need. Okay. And I can also give them our number okay. here um, directly, and it's 501-661-2408. And that number is for anyone who is interested in information about whether it's services for a client, if they would like to set up a testing event, we'll be more than happy to partner with them and provide them with the services that they need. All right. And one final question I have that I forgot to ask early on, once someone is living with this, with HIV or AIDS, how does it affect their overall quality of life? Um, in reference to if they contract another, say, cold, 
uh, flu, bronchitis, or some other health condition, how does it affect your quality of life? So for most people who are on effective medication, have an undetectable viral load, and either they're tested early and have a normal immune system, or are tested later in the disease, and after they've been on the, on the medication for a while, their immune system can recover. Um, their, you know, colds and flu and so forth are, are not necessarily more um, frequent for them or necessarily more severe. Okay. And if we get people into care, they can lead a normal lifespan and, and a healthy life. So that's where our, our emphasis is. Okay. For those who are not in care, though, and, and who have a weakened immune system or may not know that they have HIV, uh, yes, those things can be, you know, having pneumonia might be much more severe um, for some that, that get flu if they have HIV and they don't know it that that can be something that, that could end up you know they could end up being hospitalized but for most people who know their status on effective medication um, they, they can live, live, lead a normal healthy uh, life, lifespan now what about and this may sound like a silly question but someone may also have this question what if someone who is living with HIV AIDS they're on a a medicine they're on a good regimen they're following all the doctor's orders and they have say cancer or high blood pressure high cholesterol um, heart disease or you know some other something else like that how does it affect them so in a, in a simple uh, sense, if, if they're, they're living with HIV, they have an undetectable viral load, and they have, say, high blood pressure and diabetes, that, that means more medication for them to take. Okay. Um, but the, the other side of the coin is that for those who don't know their status, who have HIV for a long, long time, when the virus and the immune system are, are in this constant war, the the, the body releases a lot of substances that can cause inflammation so that um, people who don't know their status and have a HIV infection, uh, they, they age more rapidly. Okay. Um, lung disease, heart disease, uh, kidney disease can be worse by that ongoing um, uh, virus replicating in their bodies and their immune system attacking it um, so that those kind of chronic illnesses can be a little bit worse. There's also some evidence of um, increased risk of cancer, um, especially for those who smoke. There's strong evidence that that smoking even a few cigarettes a day if you have HIV infection is a very, very bad thing to do in terms of risk of heart disease, lung disease, and cancer. All right. Well, I want to thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope that your phones are starting to ring off the hook from this point on, uh, because there's so much information that needs to be put out there that people are unaware of. I was unaware of the smoking connection um, concerning HIV and AIDS, so thank you all again so very much. I want to thank everyone out there for listening and for watching. Our video will be available on YouTube if you missed any of the previous information. Um, thank you for supporting Kayla K, and don't forget to tune in tomorrow, 9 a.m., where we have we'll have another guest so thank you all from arkansas department of health out of little rock thank you for giving us your time today thank you for the opportunity all right and thank you out there kayla k supporters i uh, hope everyone has a great and blessed day and enjoy the spring like winter we're having i'll see you tomorrow 9 a.m <laughs>